Father, again, we're grateful to be here this morning to worship you in your sanctuary, to read your scripture. You are the good shepherd, Lord. Pray now that your spirit will speak and that the words that are spoken will be from you and that nothing will be from me. We thank you for the opportunities you give us, Lord, to witness, to share, and to talk about you. Again, we ask for your presence with us today. Amen. So turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Verse 1 and 2. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So you see the picture here, Jesus sitting down at a meal with, um, what does it say? Tax Tax collectors and sinners. And he's eating with them. And the scribes and Pharisees come by, and, and they don't like that, do they? Why are you eating with people like this? Well, so it says Jesus spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. So the picture is there. They are upset with Jesus. Scribes and Pharisees, they've been following him, they've been listening to him. They see him doing miracles. They hear him speaking, right? And he is speaking things that they have never thought of before. He has a wisdom that they don't understand. And yet, how can he be associating with these people? At this time, there was a, a group. They lived in a place, I think it was called the Quam, Quamran. Have you heard Quamran? I may not be pronouncing that right. But the most, um, what would you say, it was, it was kind of like a monastery, those who were the most uh, self-righteous and, and worried about sinning, right, keeping themselves from sin. They went and they lived in this place called Quamran. And um, they wouldn't allow anybody to come in. I mean, even their meals, they lived in caves and even their meals would be served, would be brought to the outside of the cave, and then they would go out and get it and take it back. And they didn't want to desecrate themselves at all. They had um, many, many ceremonial baths around uh, uh, collection containers for water so they could do their, their ceremonial baths and cleansing, and they would totally isolate themselves. They didn't want to think about evil. They didn't want to be tempted And this is the way that they felt like they should live to do that. They wouldn't even let um, female animals in the area in case they might be tempted to think something like that. The scribes and the Pharisees, however, they felt that you didn't have to live that strict of a life or in that seclusion, but that you could live with other people around you, but you had to be very careful with who you associated with. And, and we sometimes and oftentimes think in a similar fashion, right? Well, look who he hangs out with. Guilt by association, right? So as they see Jesus, as they see him do miracles, and as they hear him speak, and, and of course in the back of their minds, they are looking for the Messiah. Scribes and Pharisees, everybody was looking for the Messiah. But how could he, if he was this man... And the Messiah would have to live how? He would have to live a perfect life. How could he be the Messiah if he would eat with tax collectors and sinners? 
And so they are, they are complaining. And of course, the way they do it, it, it isn't kind. Because Christ is sitting there, Jesus is sitting there eating this meal with the tax collectors and sinners. And, and they come up and they are rudely saying this out loud. How would you like it if you're sitting there and, and you're a tax collector or a sinner and you're saying, why would you eat with people like that? Right in your face. You might think, you know, Jesus, I am a sinner. You know, I don't want to cause you any problem. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should leave. So then Jesus goes on to tell this parable that, that I read. Um, but, but Luke chapter 15 isn't a, about just one parable. Actually, it's three parables. And when Jesus says it there, if you look in verse 3, it says, He spoke this parable to them. Not just the first. The whole chapter is a parable and is broken into three parts. Three separate stories. The first one we read there. And um, so let's look back. Because Jesus is saying, um, what? I am the good shepherd. We go back to, to our scripture reading for today, Psalms chapter 23. David's psalm, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The good shepherd does what? He provides for your needs. He takes care of his sheep. He leads me beside the still waters. Well, you know sheep, sheep have wool, right? Shaggy wool. If they get into rough waters, what happens to wool when it gets wet? It gets pretty heavy, doesn't it? And if they're drinking, they get top heavy and can tumble in to the water. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. That word restores, um, I can't pronounce the Hebrew word, but it's a turning around, a coming back. He brings, the good shepherd brings us back. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We oftentimes read this psalm like it's a psalm for us. This is a psalm about the good shepherd. Okay? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the shepherd is carrying two instruments, the staff, which was either a large uh, branch that usually would have two types of hook, a shorter hook and a longer hook, and was useful for guiding the sheep or if they'd fallen into a ditch or something, you know, to help them out, right? The rod was a different type of implement the rod was a instrument for protection for offense and it could also be used for defense it was a thick stick and oftentimes on the end of it they could pound in iron pieces of iron or rock or stone so that it was a weapon that they could use when they needed to so if you can imagine walking in a dark valley maybe you see someone coming towards you and you don't know who it is and then you find out you have somebody behind you <laughs> right but when you get up to the one who's coming towards you you see that it's your best friend with his rod and his staff you will fear no evil they comfort me and then it switches because here we were talking about sheep in the first four, first four verses, but now it says what? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Sounds kind of familiar to Luke chapter 15, doesn't it? A table in the presence of their enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Old Testament was very well known to the scribes and the Pharisees. In fact, if they didn't memorize it all, they memorized large portions of it. And they knew, obviously, they knew the 23rd Psalm, but they knew by heart much more than that. So if you change or switch, turn in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter um, 23, this theme of the Good Shepherd is carried on. Jeremiah 
23. And in Jeremiah 23, it's expanded a little more. Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. So now the Lord is, or scripture is talking about what? Bad shepherds. But he goes on, verses 3 through 6, But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will rise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name, by which he will be called. What does it say? The Lord our righteousness. There will come a day when I will send what? The good shepherd. But this isn't the only place. There's many places in scripture that talk about the shepherd. Turn to page or to Ezekiel chapter 34. It's expanded on even more, the whole chapter, and we don't have time. I'm not going to read the whole chapter of Ezekiel 34, but I do want you to look with me at a few verses as we go through this. Ezekiel chapter 34, again, talking, if you have headings in your uh, Bible, the first section is irresponsible shepherds in mine. Verses 3 and 4, you eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. Those aren't good shepherds, are they? This is what Jesus is alluding to when the scribes and the Pharisees are accusing him of eating with the sinners and the publicans. They know the scripture. Ezekiel 34 goes on to talk about the good shepherd. If we look over at verses 10 to 12, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more for I will deliver my flock from their mouths that they may no longer be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. The good shepherd. But it's interesting because as we go on in this chapter of Ezekiel, we see that not only is there a good shepherd and bad shepherds, but we look at the sheep. Look at verse 17. And as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? As for my flock, they eat what, they have trampled, what you have trampled with your feet and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Sheep are not good, are they? What is he saying? There's sheep out there that when they get done eating, they had enough, there's still grass left over, but what? They trample it down so someone else can't be fed. When they get in the water, they foul the water with their feet and they foul it other ways so that people can't, or other sheep can't drink from the water. God goes after these sheep, right? Not because the sheep are good. He goes after these sheep. Why? Because he is good. 
Now, just in case you haven't picked up on the, the sheep and shepherd thing, and Jesus is talking about sheep and meaning what? Us and people. Look at verse 31 of that chapter. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says the Lord. So let's look back at Luke chapter 15. So that's what Jesus is implying as he tells these parables, these stories that he's going through. And when he says, if one of you loses a sheep, would you not leave the 90 and 9 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Not necessarily. A bad shepherd has 99 sheep. He's not going after the one sheep. And what does he do when he has found it? He lays it on his shoulder and does what? Rejoices. So the good shepherd has to what? He has to go after the sheep. He has to find the sheep. He has to rescue the sheep. And then he does what? He brings it back. And when he brings it back, what does he do? He rejoices. Rejoice with me, verse 6, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And why are they rejoicing? Verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Rejoicing over the repentance of the sheep. And over 90 and 9 who need no repentance. So Jesus is the center of the parable, right? He is showing, and we're not going to read the next one, but the next parable, there was, what did I say? There's three parts in this chapter. The lost sheep, the lost coin, right? the good shepherd, the good woman, and the lost son. You know all these parables, okay? The lost coin, the woman does what? She sweeps the house. She looks for the coin. She brings it and finds it. And when she finds it, she calls all of her friends to celebrate. And what are they celebrating? Who are they celebrating? They're celebrating the coin? Go good coin. Do they celebrate the sheep? Oh, good sheep. No, they're celebrating the good shepherd. They are celebrating with the good shepherd. The good shepherd did that. The good woman found the coin. The good father is waiting for his son. The father does what? He runs out to his son. The father puts on the clothes. The father puts on the ring. The father cooks the fat winged cow. And the father sets up the celebration. And the father celebrates. Right? The good shepherd is the father. But whether you want to look at it as part four, parable four, or part B of the third story there that we were just talking about, I want you to turn to the end of Luke. Because at the end, what do we see? Look at verse 24. Um, no, 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house and heard music and dancing. Okay? So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to them, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Who went out? The father went out. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. 
And he said, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now it's interesting here because um, all the first three parts have endings, right? There's no ending to this. We don't know what the elder son did, do we? We know that the father called the elder son. But we also know from the beginning of the parable that Jesus is talking to who? Or the beginning of the chapter? Who? The scribes and Pharisees. Many people think that um, if you really want to get into the hard sections of the Bible, the deep theology, you have to look at Paul's writing, right? What does Peter say? Some things that Paul says are difficult to understand. But Jesus, he just tells stories that are easy to understand, parables. And while parables are easy on certain levels, do you think that uh, Jesus doesn't have the wisdom of Paul? That these stories aren't deep on many, many levels beyond what we can comprehend oftentimes. So Jesus is telling this story and he takes them through the lost sheep and what is he saying to them in these stories? You see, the Jews would kill Jesus, right? And they would kill him for what? Blasphemy, right? Blasphemy, to say you are God. And of course, they rejected him as God. And true, if, if you aren't God, it is blasphemy. But Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. That was their question. How can you sit here and eat with publicans and sinners? Because I am the good shepherd. Because I came for publicans and sinners. But at the end, at the end of the chapter and the end of the stories, he is saying what? I come out to the older brother. I came for you too. Do you think they got it? We don't know because the story ends there. But it's the same message for us today. The message is what? I am the good shepherd. I came for all my sheep. I came for my good sheep. <laughs> I came for those who think they're good, but I came for the bad sheep also. I am the good shepherd. So that's the question for us this morning. Are we going to hear the message? Are we going to follow the shepherd? There's so many lies out there today about Jesus, some even in our church. Jesus didn't need to die for us, right? That's one lie. Mary can save us. Salvation through Marianism, right? Jesus is just another good prophet like Muhammad. There's many, many. Jesus isn't actually God, son of God, but he's not God. Jesus said, I am, I am that I am, I am the good shepherd. I just want to end here this morning. I want to look, just turn the last verse we'll look at here today. First John chapter five. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. Verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, the Pharisees were good at keeping commandments, right? Verses 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our what? Faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that what? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Good Shepherd. He did come. He did die. He did pay that price, right? He went out. He paid the price. He picked up the sinner. He brought us home. And his invitation to you is to what? Believe that he is who he is. So that's what I ask of you today. Will you commit, will you recommit to believing that Jesus, the Son of God, is the Good Shepherd and he came for you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you Lord, that you are the good shepherd. You have done everything in your power for each one of us. May we accept that. May we have faith in who you are and your amazing love for us. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Here, oh, here.